So, it's no secret that there's something of a pricing problem in the GPU space. The cost of a new graphics card seems to be going up all the time, with the lion's share of the value increases reserved only for the most expensive hardware. Meanwhile, the generational increases in performance in the $250 to $350 mark seem to be tailing off, right? But Intel aims to make a difference. Its recent foray into the discrete graphics market has delivered the Arc A750 and the A770, priced between $289 to $349. And in this video brought to you by Digital Foundry and Intel, we're not going to retread the review, though I will be doing a quick recap. Instead, what I was curious about was the whole idea of what kind of experience the new ARC cards can deliver. What kind of performance in key titles do I want and how do I get it and can ARC deliver? You see, don't get me wrong, I love benchmarking new hardware and yeah, price versus performance metrics are all well and good, but ultimately, when you actually buy a new GPU, you're not plugging it in and running it at ultra settings and comparing it to other GPUs. It's all about the individual gameplay experience. And I think this is something that perhaps we as reviewers need to improve on. There's a kind of disconnect between the raw numbers and actually living with a new piece of PC equipment. With that said, the raw numbers are quite impressive, I have to say. Intel promised a GPU that would deliver better than RTX 3060 performance, and outside of some outlier titles, that's exactly what the two cards deliver on games that use the latest graphics APIs, uh, DX12 and Vulkan. However, uh, there is still work to be done on DX11 and older APIs. Intel has said as much. But on the flip side, Intel also promised ray tracing performance that beats the competition. And again, that's exactly what we get. RT is typically combined with image reconstruction technology and Intel developed its own machine learning based upscaler, XCSS. Now a while back, Alex took a look at that, but I'll be checking it out in more titles in this video. And of course, while Nvidia DLSS support is obviously off the table, AMD's FSR2 technology works on Arc as well. So there are more upscaling options than Intel's alone. So here's the deal. In its marketing, Intel has talked about bringing balance back to the market, about delivering more performance for the money at the price points that actually matter to many gamers. Which brings me on to something else typical of GPU reviews. Everyone reviews a new graphics card with a top of the line CPU of the moment to better isolate pure graphics performance. And this is entirely valid, of course, but maybe it doesn't reflect the way people are actually going to be using the product. So I decided to build my own balanced PC, stripping back the ultra top end kit and mirroring the kind of price versus performance ideal that Arc represents. It all starts with the components, of course, and I've chosen the Core i5-12400F for my balance system, paired with two 8 gig sticks of 3200 MHz DDR4 from Corsair. These are like the no-brainer buys for a system to match with the Arc graphics card. But at this point, I faced a crossroads. Do I go for ultra-budget components, or do I invest a little more cash with a view to more upgradability down the line and better features and acoustics in the here and now? Well, there are some power-limited cheapo motherboards out there that would likely do the job just fine with this particular processor, but I ended up spending a little more on an MSI B660M Mortar Micro ATX motherboard. Storage? No need for a mechanical hard drive these days, even for a budget build. I picked up a 1TB Crucial P3 Plus NVMe SSD, which slots right into the board. Good gaming performance, no cables required. The stock cooler you get with a 12400F works fine, but for better temperatures and much less noise, I went for a Be Quiet BK007 Pure Rock 2. All of this was mounted in a Fantex Eclipse 400A case. Power supply, I went for a Corsair 650 watt PSU. This one is modular in nature, which means that I only need to plug in the cables that are actually required for my specific hardware. Makes for a more elegant, easier to manage build. Finally, the star of the show, I used the Arc A770 Limited Edition to complete the build. It's the top end Intel card, and for the additional $60 over the already very decent A750, you get more performance, around 5 to 15% in general, 
um, but you also get uh, 16 gigs of VRAM, which is very nice to have. Overkill, perhaps, but am I willing to pay that extra $60 for that memory and for that extra performance? Well, yes, I am. And here's the completed build. You'll note no real RGB craziness here, but you do get a very tasteful RGB solution on the A770 Limited Edition itself, which sits very nicely in this build. Once you power up the PC, I recommend a couple of options before you install Windows. First of all, updating the BIOS of the board is recommended for better compatibility. And secondly, a lot of people forget to enable the XMP profile of their memory. In CPU limited gaming, faster memory improves performance. So yeah, don't leave that on default. Finally, the memory controller on the Arc GPU is designed for high bandwidth throughput. So you really need to enable resizable bar in the BIOS to get the full performance of the card. Now this does mean that Arc is best suited for users of 10th gen core or Ryzen 3000 class processors or better. Uh, which is no problem for our 12400F though, obviously. So we've got our balanced PC now. So the question is, what are we going to do with it? Intel talks about the Arc products serving 1080p and 1440p gaming, but it does seem to be 1440p that is the most popular resolution for gaming these days. So that's where I decided to focus. But with that said, every title has a different performance profile. And with upscaling technology like XCSS working so well at 4K, well, for a few games, I decided to focus on that instead. Onto my gameplay tests then. And just to be clear, while this video may be brought to you in association with Intel, these are my game choices, my settings, and my choice of content from within those games. And yeah, regular viewers will know about my tastes and my stress tests, and you'll be seeing some familiar gaming areas revisited. And since this is personal, let's just say that even though these are price versus performance orientated cards, I still want to tap into cutting edge rendering features. Laying down the gauntlet, first of all, is Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition, a AAA narrative based first person shooter that will only run on GPUs that support hardware accelerated ray tracing. Uh, the game is available on consoles and PS5 and Series X, aimed for 60 FPS gaming with dynamic resolution scaling that runs from anywhere under 1080p up to 4K at the absolute maximum. Now it's unfortunate that dynamic res isn't supported on PC, but I'm aiming for a 1440p output here to match a Quad HD display. Here are my chosen settings then. Ultra quality overall with tessellation on and high ray tracing enabled. So consoles don't have tessellation active and the quality settings are a weird hybrid of high ultra and extreme, something you can't do within the settings available on PC. So to maintain a solid frame rate, I've set resolution scaling to 0.8. So that means that temporal data from prior frames is injected into the current one to make up the resolution difference. And it works pretty well. Here's how it stacks up against Xbox Series X. Pretty close match overall in this stage, uh, but here in the Caspian, you can see something interesting. The hybrid settings on Xbox means you get extreme detail close up, so more detail than PC, but detail further in the distance is much lower. Regardless though, we have a fixed resolution on PC, we have a tessellation feature active, we have better draw distance, we're good to go. By and large, we get a lock to 60 frames per second here. Traversing the Tiger represents one of the toughest areas in the game. It's where the consoles most often drop to 1080p or lower on PlayStation 5, but we're able to power on regardless here with our Arc build, with only the smallest of drops in the densest forest areas. Now, I'd recommend an adaptive sync or VRR screen for any PC gamer. It's pretty much a standard feature these days on most monitors. This smooths out dips in performance, as minor as they are, to the point where they're basically unnoticeable in play. Regardless though, I'd say this is a great start for Arc. Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition is a cutting edge game that's not to be trifled with, and it's running great here, I'd say. Next up, Remedies Control, which is a game I often return to. So on consoles, you get a 30 FPS quality mode, which is effectively PC on a kind of low, medium settings hybrid with RT reflections and glass reflections active. Performance mode, 60 FPS there, no RT, 1440p. I wanted to see how Arc would compare here, bearing in mind that we do have more ray tracing performance than the consoles. 
But first of all, performance mode. No problems here. I can ramp up almost everything to the max on Arc with no RT and run it at 1440p60 locked. Uh, to ensure stability, I turned off MSAA, which isn't really needed. And I also reduced volumetric quality down just a touch. And no matter how crazy things get in control, and the pyrotechnics can be intense, well, the game just plays out locked to 60 frames per second here. I was quite pleased about this, but I think it's worth pointing out that the difference between console hybrid low medium settings and high settings, uh, as we're seeing here with Arc, isn't game changing, but ray tracing is. So in this comparison, I'm running Arc on console settings, which is 1440p with those hybrid uh, rasterization settings and RT reflections and transparency reflections active. Uh, the RT effects are actually of a higher precision on PC generally, and it actually would have been useful to have those console optimizations ported into the PC build. Alas, it didn't happen. Still, I found that Arc could run a fair amount of the game at 60 FPS anyway. When it drops, we're in 50 to 60 territory generally, with minimums, the absolute minimums in the 40s, as you're seeing here in the corridor of doom. We can't really show how this would look on a VRR screen on a YouTube video, uh, but it would be my preferred way to play over a non-RT experience that is locked to 60. In trying to get the smoothest footage though, I found a rather interesting feature in the Intel Arc control panel. It's called Smart Sync. When it's enabled on a 60 Hz panel and when the game runs at 60 FPS, uh, you get a V-Sync presentation with no tearing, looks good. However, when frame rate drops beneath 60, tearing kicks in. But this is tearing that looks rather different to what I've seen before. And if we freeze frame here, you can see what Smart Sync is doing. It's blending the two torn frames together. It's a pretty neat solution here. Now, it doesn't solve the problem of wobbling video on lateral movements, especially fast moving lateral movement. But the tearing artifact itself is smoothed out to a certain degree. It's a really interesting option. Next game, and let's go straight into a rasterization powerhouse. Forza Horizon 5. With the settings here, I'm essentially using the same quality as Xbox Series X in its performance mode, thanks to those settings that were provided by Playground Games. And these essentially give you a locked 1440p60 on A770, a really decent experience. A couple of stress points to put this to the test, and we'll kick off with the game's actual benchmark, which flies by exactly as it should. It's in a dense cityscape, cycles through weather conditions and keeps a lot of high detail cars on screen. Elsewhere, I've found that the combination of a lot of foliage along with storm conditions can cause some graphics hardware some issues. And there's a good exhibition showcase that lets us test this and the A770 acquits itself with no problems at all. So Arc A770, Playground Games approved settings for console performance, 1440p60, job done. I was curious about 4K though, as Series X has a 4K30 quality mode using dynamic resolution scaling, and it kind of straddles ultra and extreme settings. Now I just ramped up everything up to extreme, engaged the game's inbuilt 30fps cap, and just played the game. Ran perfectly at native 4K 30 frames per second, and it just looks absolutely glorious. So yes, yeah, slightly higher settings than Xbox Series X in its quality mode, no dynamic resolution scaling required, and the Arc A770 just powers through here. Looks really impressive. Sticking with a 4K output at 30 frames per second, there are a few games that I can think of that are really, really heavy on the CPU, to the point where to get the most out of your GPU, it may make sense to limit the frame rate and instead double down on detail, resolution, graphical features, or both. Uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator is an interesting example of this, because no matter what PC hardware I've tested it on, I've yet to see this game running flawlessly at 60 frames per second locked. So with Arc A770 at 4K30 output, I can push for full ultra settings here on one of the most beautiful PC games there is. The only compromise I made was to set internal resolution to 75 or 80%. The game's TAA solution uses temporal reprojection to scale back up to 4K using detail from prior frames. And in a slower paced game like this, it's really hard to tell the difference. Xbox Series X also has a 30 FPS target, uses ultra settings with some compromises and scales up from 1440p resolution to 4K. So ultimately with Arc here, we're getting a sharper image 
and no compromises at all from the Ultra preset. And performance wise, well we can't exactly run frame rate tests across the board, bearing in mind that the game literally encompasses the entire world, but my favourite hotspot testing areas like London run at 30 FPS with little problem, it seems. Uh, almost got there with Rio de Janeiro, though I did note that here the 75% resolution scale is required to handle its ultra-dense forests with no frame drops. It doesn't really make too much of a difference visually compared to 80%, but you get that solid performance. Ultimately though, Microsoft Flight Simulator isn't just one of the most demanding games out there, it's also one of the most beautiful, and I was happy to see that I could run it well on the Arc. I guess running at 1440p on a 1440p screen is obviously an option, but I'd still recommend a frame rate cap in the 40 to 45 FPS territory. This game has a real stuttering problem, and it's not because of the graphics, it's not because of the hardware, it's because the demands on the CPU are just so intense. I'm going to stick with 4K for a little while now because I want to talk about Intel XESS, the firm's answer to Nvidia's DLSS, based on very similar principles. It's early days on this technology, but Alex has already carried out a deep dive into its strengths and areas where it might need to improve a touch. But ultimately, for a first effort, it's amazing to see an actual competitor to the established DLSS. And it does mean that in many titles, Arc can punch above its weight in delivering 4K at 60 frames per second. Let's look at Death Stranding Director's Cut because I think first of all, Kojima Productions deserves praise for supporting all upscaling solutions. Nobody gets left behind here. I should stress that there's no issue at all running this title at 1440p 60 or above, uh, no upscaling needed, but at 4K, XESS works well here in taking a 1080p base image and delivering a very 4K-like presentation. 1080p internal is actually the performance mode for XESS, but the vast majority of Death Stranding actually plays out just fine using balanced or even quality modes, uh, the only issue being that you're more likely to find drops from 60fps in certain circumstances. Cutscenes can be pretty heavy here, but this isn't really a problem if you have an adaptive sync VRR screen, which, as I said earlier, I think it should be kind of standard equipment for any PC gamer at this point. It really is a killer feature. More 4K with Marvel's Spider-Man Remastered, which I've spent a lot of time with across a range of videos. Now, this is another game I admire for its upscaling support. It embraces everything, basically. DLSS, FSR2 and XESS, the way it should be. This game is very heavy on CPU, which is why I've gone for a 4K 60 presentation on this one. Frame rates can run higher at 1440p, but with ray tracing active in particular, the 12400F gets pushed to its limits quite easily, so it's better to cap frame rate and divert GPU resources into features like higher resolution. 4K60 on balanced XESS mode works fine and looks really decent actually, and we're effectively running on optimized settings here, as defined by Alex in our DF Tech review. I think the Arca A770 could actually push further in RT settings at 1440p, but the CPU requirements do so is pretty intense. Optimized settings gives the best bang for the buck, keeps you at 60 pretty much constantly, and looks pretty phenomenal. The only issue I had here in my testing was game stability. A few crashes here and there, something I have experienced before on other platforms, but certainly intrusive to the experience here. I had no stability issues at all on any other title, I should add. I also wanted to spend some time with Hitman 3 as opposed to just benchmarking it as we usually do. What you're actually seeing here is a similar approach to what we did with Marvel Spider-Man, which is to use optimized settings, the best bang for the buck in terms of rendering cost versus quality of presentation. Although this time, the settings weren't chosen by us, but rather by developer IO Interactive itself in setting the baseline for what the console versions should run at. We made a couple of changes to that, the biggest one being to improve simulation quality. This is really heavy on CPU, but definitely worthwhile and well within the capabilities of the 12400F. Rendering wise, this game runs at 1800p on PS5, native 4K on Series X. Here, we're using XESS on balanced mode to get to 4K on those same quality settings this is an absolute feast visually, looking extremely clean. For a first-gen take on machine learning based image upscaling, XESS is delivering some really nice results here. However, 
IO has also added ray tracing support to the game which isn't available on the consoles. Two RT options available here, reflections which look really impressive, alongside RT shadows which aren't quite so impactful, but certainly contribute to a big hit to performance. By dropping down to 1440p and sticking to XESS balance mode, you can still enjoy those RT reflections and still hit 60fps for the vast majority of play. Uh, it's not quite a lock to 60 frames per second here in all scenarios, but nothing that a VRR screen wouldn't smooth out, or of course you could simply drop down to XESS performance mode. So two great options for Hitman here with ARC, 4K without RT running flawlessly, or 1440p with RT reflections. And either one just looks great. I really enjoyed my time with this game. So Hitman's RT mode is notorious for being exceptionally heavy on the GPU, but I think ARC pulls off a quality experience here. Still, IO's assault on the GPU doesn't hold a candle to what developer Techland does with RT in its ultra ray tracing mode in Dying Light 2. So yes, RT shadows and ambient occlusion as on consoles are available, but there's more, much more. Reflections are added and most crucially, ray trace global illumination is included in the mix and that is the feature that truly elevates the game. The question is the extent to which a mainstream card like the ARC A770 can accommodate those high-end features at our target 1440p. Again, all good upscaling solutions are supported now, meaning DLSS, FSR2 and yes, XESS. XESS 1440p performance mode keeps you in 50 to 60 FPS territory on the Ultra RT setting, so not quite the 60 FPS lock I'd like for a fixed frequency monitor, but perfectly great actually for a VRR screen. I'd usually recommend XESS balanced as a minimum at 1440p, but in this case, performance actually looks pretty good. But this is PC, right? And we have options. Optimized settings on this one essentially involves starting with the Ultra RT preset, then dipping into the advanced settings menu, disabling RT reflections and the RT flashlight. These can be turned off without too much of a hit to the game's visuals. And in return, the upshot is that we get a lock to 60 FPS in XESS performance mode, or you can move back to the balanced mode, as you're seeing here, with the kind of minor drops beneath 60 that once again Adaptive Sync or VRR smooths out for you. Okay then, so that's a whole lot of testing, right? It was actually a luxury to play PC games non-stop for a few days to put ARC through its paces. And I kind of wish I could produce content like this for every major GPU release. Percentage differentials against competing GPUs are obviously extremely important information. But once you've defined a set level of performance, for me, it's all about what you can do with it. And I have a number of takeaways from my time with the A770 in my balanced PC rig. First of all, for the games I play, AAA with cutting edge rendering features, the ARC cards really work well. Intel mostly talks about ARC for 1080p as well as 1440p gaming. My experience at 1440p and even 4K has been pretty positive, I'd say, but I'd imagine these cards would absolutely scream at full HD. And yeah, there are two ARC cards available. Uh, we looked at the A770 here, obviously. It's about 5 to 15% faster than the A750, depending on the title. So everything you've seen here, it's not as if the A750 experience is going to be that much different. Uh, so I'd say that there's actually genuine value across both of these cards. I also think the emphasis on RT performance and machine learning built into the Intel design here. It's a proven formula that's worked for Nvidia and it's going to work for Intel too. And Intel has delivered impressive stuff on both RT and machine learning, bearing in mind this is literally a first gen product. But let's be clear, as you've seen from my gameplay demonstrations, these cards are capable. They are very well priced and in the case of the A770 in particular, a 16 gigabyte GPU for $349 US. Really impressive. So that's it, that's the video and I hope you enjoyed it. Like, subscribe, share if you did. And if you'd like to see more experience-based testing of new PC hardware, do let me know. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching.